So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to part two of day one of the association journey presentation. I'm Alushka Ritchie, president of the World Federation of Tourist Guide Associations. It is once again my pleasure to have our associations presenting, and we're really proud of what they've been doing over this last year. I would like to hand over to Esther Banika, who will be facilitating today's session. Esther has played a huge part in WFTGA family over the last many years and has dedicated much of her time to an exec, being an executive board member as well as vice president. Today she is joining us as WFTGA brand ambassador and will be facilitating this session. Esther, thank you for your time today and I know that our presenters are in capable hands with you, so I'll hand over to thank you. you. Thank you. Well, I want to welcome all the viewers from across the globe who've tuned into today's uh, session, the WFTGA Association Journey. Let us also extend our welcome to the presenters on our program today. I will introduce them by association name uh, in the order of their presentations, and then they will introduce themselves later when they begin their presentations. So let me tell you who's going to be with us today. Uh, we might have a few others who are not on screen right now who will be joining us, but we will have the Spanish Confederation of Federations of Associations of Professional Tour Guides and the Association Professionnelle de Guides Touristiques de Montreal. Please pardon my incorrect French uh, pronunciation and the Association de Guides Touristiques de Quebec. We have the Malta Union of Tourist Guides, Tour Guides Association of Namibia, a, an Association of Qualified Guides of Copenhagen, the Portuguese Association of Tourist Guides and Tour Managers, the Guides Association of New York City, USA, Tour Guides Association in the Republic of Kazakhstan, the Association of Tour Guides Andorra, the Slovak Tourist Guides Association, the Association of Guides, Lecturers and Translators, and the Approved Tourist Guides of Ireland. Each of them will have about 12 minutes to make their presentations. And then I, I will uh, call on the next presenters to do theirs after I give a one minute warning. Uh, let's see, I guess I should introduce myself as well. I'm Esther Banneke, and as Alushka said, I uh, served on the executive board from 2011 to 2019. I was the ex executive board secretary and a former vice president of WFTGA. I live near Chicago, Illinois, which is in the USA. I should also introduce uh, our current Expo members who were able to join this particular presentation. And of course, you know Aluska Richki, our uh, president. And we have Viola Lewis, Viola uh, Wave, there you go, who is the head of training. Now, you know that meetings are most successful when everyone knows and follows the rules. So please note the following, which are general rules of engagement for a Zoom meeting. And we've gone over these uh, ahead of time and everyone's agreed to these, but for the sake of those who have tuned in to know what uh, rules we're following, I will repeat them. Everyone understands the purpose of this meeting and will stick to the agenda. Their videos are on, of course. This session is being recorded to be seen and listened to later on various platforms. Sometimes the mute buttons will be turned on for various reasons. And you might hear the presenters asking each other questions at certain times if we have time, because our time is limited and we will stick to our points of discussion. And you will notice that we're all kind and respectful to each other. This would be a good time to also briefly address some housekeeping matters here. As I said, 12 minutes maximum speaking time. The questions will be addressed to the presenting association. And then um, 
So they're the only ones who will be recognized to ask questions. Uh, let's see, we will have some questions that, um, well, all of the questions will be about the associations because these uh, sessions are for you, about you, and not about the organization WFTGA itself. I, uh, I'm not sure everyone knows the purpose of these sessions. So let me read the WFTGA's official response. This is an opportunity for you, our WFTGA association members, to share your challenges that you have faced this year from your association and your membership's point of view. It is also an opportunity to share your success stories. We realize that many of you have embarked on wonderful internal journeys and projects, and we look forward to you sharing these with our members and tourist guides across the globe. This program presents us with an environment to inspire, to learn, to acknowledge, and to support one another. This session is for our members, about our members, and by no means will the focus be on matters related to WFTGA itself. Now, unless uh, there are some comments or questions about how this program will proceed, I'm going to uh, introduce our first presenters from Spain. Ready to go? Okay, the Spanish Confederation of Federations of Associations and Professional Tour Guides, please show us what you've been doing. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning. Well, that's the first one today. Uh, myself, Juan Ignacio, got in for more than 30 years in the city of Toledo, Veracruz, Madrid. Let me tell you about uh, what we have uh, made uh, this year, this special year. Um, well, we are Cefapit, as in our logo, you can see, Cefapit, Guides of Spain. That's our, let's say, our commercial name. Our confederation is quite old, with 32 years of life. We are a confederation of associations. Our members are not individual tour guides, but regional or local associations of tour guides. And we have associations from all, all the regions of Spain. Our main goal is the defense of the profession with the national authorities and regional or local ones when our members require our support. In Spain, tourism and the profession of tour guides is responsibility not of the country, but of each region. That's why there is not only one national regulation for us, but on each region, the laws concerning tour guides are completely different. In Spain, almost 95% of tour guides are self-employed. The situation this year has been like almost everywhere, I guess. Since March to June, first lockdown, no work, and cancellations came one after another. Between June and September, everybody in Spain thought that local or domestic tourism was going to rescue the season, but no way. Few people moved and few people and few money was spent because of fear to coronavirus. And since October, the second lockdown, with uh, no reservations, no activity and minimum groups. In the most of the cities of Spain, no more than six people together, even for the visits. Well, I want to start with the event that we saw in Spain on TV every day in the news in February, when still the only news about coronavirus came from China, we had an especial news in Spain. The first cases in the country, in one hotel in the Canary Islands, then 1,000 tourists on lockdown in that hotel. And I want to remember, especially here, the role played in the situation by the tour guides of that association of the Canary Islands. They offer their time and their help to translate to the clients. Here there, for instance, 
three of our tour guide outside of that hotel, translating in different languages to the clients because they were they in lockdown. And they were there to translate uh, clients, um, to translate doctors, nurses, travel agencies, airport, embassies, even with the psychologists to help those tourists. During this period of lockdown, we have made two videos. The first one has had a title, Choose Well Who Is Guiding You. And to support it, our associations organized in the most of the cities of, cities of Spain concentrations of tour guides with that motto. And in many news from the whole country, we appeared and, and on the social networks and we talked about that motto. It was chosen for people to distinguish between qualified guides and those ones like the free tours that are not qualified, qualified not trained, and few taxes were paid by them. Here, that was in Segovia, or in Cordoba, and here in the Canary Islands on the right, Murcia on the left. And a second video with the title, Don't Let Them Tell You Stories, was made by, with tour guides of the Confederation, prepared by an important cinema director of Spain. Here there are some photos of the video with important messages. We are professionals. We are qualified, we pay taxes, we are the professionals. I am an official tour guide and I am licensed to, to perform it. If you have official guide, we'll win. Part of our fees and what we get from you goes back to society to improve the economy. The image of the destination we show depends on the way we work. Our work is not just a job. It is like giving the tourist or, or visitor a piece of us. We show you unique places in a different way. Don't let them tell you stories. It is better to have them brought to life by an official tour guide. Don't let them tell you stories. Well, the most of us have received on this period since March until January next year, financial aid from the country of about 650 euro per month, plus the approximate, approximate 280 euro that they return to us from the, from the monthly social security fee. This aid was not received as tour guides, but as self-employed. This aid was given to the most of the self-employed of Spain. And some municipalities or regions have given an amount of money between 200 or 1,500 euro. Even some of them have given nothing at all, that's true. But some money of the administration would, was used to promote visits that we are not that free for the visitors, but the administration pays tour guides. That's what we, that's what we wanted. We don't want um, to receive nothing for nothing. We want to work and to be paid by our work. In this case, the administration plays the role of a travel agency and the most of the clients have been locals or visitors from the country. It was a very useful idea for locals to know their own cities because many times people visit other cities before theirs. Here are some of those visits in cities like in Zamora, and Benavente, northern of Spain with local visitors, or in Cáceres on the right, that's Madrid, the Plaza Mayor of Madrid, also waiting for the local clients and more cities in Alicante or Valladolid, also where, as I repeat, the guides were paid by the administration on those tours for the, for the locals. During this period, we had a direct contact with the Ministry of Tourism of Spain, with a person who acts as an advisor for us. This was possible because we always try to keep the contact with the administration, with the ministry. We send them information about our confederation, our assemblies, and so on. Sometimes they don't answer, but sometimes they do. And now, 
that contact was very important because and now this contact has been very important because for them we were the official representatives of the profession at a national level and the aids arrived faster and with less problems and because of that as well five members of the community the committee of our confederation have collaborated as experts at a national level with the ministries of tourism and health in the de level development of the protocol for tour guides in spain in the face of covid 19. and moreover we are also participating as experts in the elaboration of the international iso standard measures to, re to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 in the tourism industry. All of us, like now, use Zoom or other platforms to communicate with the rest of the world. As a national confederation, we paid the annual subscription to Zoom, but we offer it to all our members. One minute. One so one. the association members of the National Confederation don't have to pay it again. Also several trainings organized by us, by a confederation, and also by some local guides. But a very important issue for us is the union and the visibility. We all have the same, um, the same lanyard, the same ID holder, and also with masks. All of us need masks. We have made that mask for all the guides of the of Spain, so everybody can recognize us. And we hope that soon we'll all will use it when we start to work in the next, I hope, year. <clears throat> well, that's all. Well, perfect timing. Uh, does anyone have a specific question for one? We have uh, a minute or so to take some questions from our panelists. I, I do have a question for Juan. <laughs> Um, because um, the same happened in Portugal. We did have some help from our government, but not specifically for tour tourist guides, but for all self-employed. Uh, but that ended in August. Is there any plan in Spain or at least in the region of um, Toledo for further help? Because of course we know that our tourism business won't resume until let's hope March or April. So now we face a void, at least in Portugal we do, we face a void of uh, this long winter without any revenues. Is there any approach from you to your, your government about that? Uh, not as uh, guides, not as tour guides, but to follow self-employed self by now until January. At the national level, there are some regions, now I keep half my mind, uh, Asturias and Murcia, I think, that they have help for tour guides, but at the national level, no. Thank you, Juan. Welcome. Um, I think we all feel that the question that uh, Christina asked is something that all of us is interested to know. Thank you so much, Juan, for your presentation. And if we might move on now to um, Canada, we have two associations be represented by the same speaker. If you would introduce yourself, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Esther, for this opportunity. So. Um, my name is Frederick Mandel, I, today I'm representing APGT of Montreal and uh, also the uh, AGTQ of Quebec City. And so uh, let's start uh, my presentation as quickly as possible. There. And so uh, on our Today's program uh, will present you an overview of our association when the uh, crisis is Quebec, the actions taken by uh, the association, the effects of the crisis on our industry, the response and help that we receive or the lack of thereof from the government, and a little bit of vision for the future. 
And so uh, today, so I'm, I'm myself, I'm the uh, vice president of APGT, which is the Professional Tourist Guides Association of Montreal. I've been a guide since uh, 2017. And my association is one of the oldest tourist guide association in North America. It was founded in 1975. We have more than 170 active members. And then we managed to add some members this year because we had a class. It's in order to be a guide in Montreal, we have to follow a two hour, two hour and 200 hour and 40 hours of training program. And you have to be certified and have a license from the city of Montreal. And so 95% pretty much like in Spain are freelancers. And our mission is to promote our craft among the various players of the tourism industry and also organize professional development activities. And also today I'm representing our sister association in Quebec City, the Quebec City Tour Guide Association or AGTQ, which has more than 250 members. Also their members follow a mandatory recognized program and they hold a license from the city of Quebec. And so they are certif certified. And so their mission is pretty much the same as the APGT and they, they promote the profession to the public and ensure a sustained and effective representation of the tour guides. And so pretty much like in the rest of the world, the uh, crisis started in, in Quebec uh, around March. So we see, uh, I won't go to all the dates on this slide here, but uh, importantly, so on March 13, as the same time as we shut down schools for at least two weeks at the time, it was also the time when the government put the cruise season on hold. And so three days later, March 16, we closed the border, the Canadian border with every country except the USA, which will follow on the 18th. And then uh, we kind of went on then uh, more and more shutdowns, uh, gatherings, and some Montreal became the uh, country's hotspot. So uh, one fourth of all case cases in the country were around Montreal, and we'll see the effects of that later. And so, in uh, so you can see that in Montreal here, the Place des Festivals, our uh, place where we have uh, lots of music shows, entertainment that was transformed into a testing center for this occasion in spring. And so the Quebec went on pause until May 14, even May 18 for Montreal because we were the hotspot. And so after that in May and June, uh, we saw a gradual op um, opening, uh, some activities started, but uh, most summer events, uh, they were announcing their uh, postponement or cancellation at the time. The borders are still closed. Very few people travel inside Quebec or Canada at the time. And lots of people are asking, what can we do? Is it safe to do uh, uh, tours at the time? How can we do it? And so uh, one of the first action we took as an association was to uh, publish guidelines on how to guide safely with the sanitary measures. So those were based on mostly on government guidelines also. We open channel of communications with all involved parties, local tourist board, local authorities, inbound travel agency, the tourism industry alliance. So we also launched a survey on our members to better grasp their situation, how they were doing professionally and financially, uh, what they were expecting uh, for the future. And we had lots of board meetings at the time and you can see also on the picture here that uh, we had two uh, volunteers, uh, two members that uh, created and made those uh, masks. So we gave one mask to each member of our association here. And so what else could we do to promote guide tours? We are a nonprofit, uh, nonprofit organization. We don't have a lot of money, but there are also lots of well-established local tour agencies that hire us. And so we sense also that most of the visitors would come from Montreal and the surrounding areas. Uh, lots of, not too many people at the time in the province would want to come to Montreal. They were afraid that would they catch COVID. And so what could we do? So we added pages to our website. And uh, so those, those were links to a local tour agency that employs us. And so uh, people could hire a guide or a tour 
directly with those pages. And we also followed that by a media campaign. So we went on TV, radio, newspaper. In one image on the slide, you can see our uh, president here giving interview on news uh, station. And so that campaigns at uh, two uh, objectives. So they were to promote tours offered in these uh, cities, but also to raise their general public awareness of the situation affecting tourist guide because many times uh, in the media, they were talking about the uh, how tourism industry was affected, but they were mostly talking about uh, hotels and uh, attractions, but not a lot of the like to people like tourist guides. And what else could we do also? And so uh, we organize local uh, tours aim at locals. So uh, participants would discover some uh, neighborhoods uh, that we were uh, to showcase our expertise. And that was also connected with another media campaign. But that uh, uh, ended up with mixed results. Uh, we had some low attendance for some tours. Uh, people were still afraid to go out and in, even in small group. And the letter once on our calendar uh, had to be canceled due to the second wave in September and October. Uh, obviously, 2020 was supposed to be a fantastic year here in Montreal. After a record year since uh, 2017, we even forecast a better year. Our agendas were getting filled with re reservation, little did we know. We even had um, events until uh, March uh, 11 uh, here at the APGT. We had a conference just two days before the shutdown. So we were uh, very hopeful. And when the, the uh, activity started for the summer, uh, we thought that maybe we could uh, have some kind of uh, season, but it was the worst summer in more than 100 years. So historic lows for every uh, data you can see a 70% decline in attendance at major attractions, even the low occupancy rate in hotels. Same story in Quebec City. Quebec City has lots of cruises, so a cancellation of all cruises means a loss of 224,000 visitors for the year, which means an, uh, some uh, value of $500 million that the city didn't get. And so, uh, that was obviously a disaster for tourist guides. Thankfully, we got some help from the uh, government of Canada, which uh, came to the form of the emergency response benefit that gave us uh, $2,000 a month. That was not specific to, uh, to guides. That was for every worker in the country who lost their income. So if you were an employee or self-employed, you could get those uh, benefits. Now the government has... Uh, uh, is coming up with another program that will have uh, income supplement until the uh, 2021. And that was very simple and quick. You just have to fill a small form and then you receive the money. We had another proposal here and uh, to our both association, we presented a joint pro pro project to uh, uh, local authorities, which each city would subsidize tours for uh, local people, they would get free tours that they would book to their local agencies. And then the, those agencies would get reimbursed by public fund. Uh, unfortunately, we, had, uh, we, didn't, and we didn't receive any support from uh, local authorities. To this day, we continue to think that this would have been a, a very good idea that was a support tourist guide, employers, the visitors would have benefit and even local tourist boards. Uh, in Quebec City, they got some help. Uh, they received a subsidy from the uh, local tourist board there, and they used that money to uh, a campaign to promote guided tours on Facebook and local radio stations. We have uh, some uh, glimmer of hope here in Canada because uh, we're maybe among the top nations for the uh, health crisis management. Frederick, uh, one minute, please. And so, okay. And so we are, and I just found out that we have in the top three for uh, international destinations, traveler will feel most comfortable visiting in the next five years. So we have some hope. Uh, we'll see how uh, will uh, the industry will have evolved. The, everything will be mostly uh, different. Customers, the agency, the structure, 
uh, we'll see maybe much more uh, le less crews around here. And so uh, hopefully uh, everybody will uh, have some work in the future. And so I thank you for your attention and uh, merci. So merci, Frederick. And uh, at this point here, we have time for a couple of questions from our other presenters. Who would like to ask Frederick? Thing. Anyone at all? If not, I have something, if that's allowed for the moderator to ask. Being uh, for us, the border from you. We have lots of Americans who are wondering when we can come back and visit your beautiful country. Are there any projected dates when the restriction would uh, be lifted? I think for now the uh, the border is still closed until uh, Christmas, but I don't see the border opening before January or even February, I think. That's the, the earliest we can see from now. Thank you. Anyone else? Esther, I'd, I would just like to pose a question from those watching. Um, a, one question that's come up, um, and I think this might be more for Jean, but it's about um, are the masks financed by the government or private sector, and um, are they sold to the guides or given to the guides? Um, Frederick, I don't know if you perhaps have an answer. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Um, the masks that you use, are they financed by the government or, or do you have to pay for them and are they given freely to the guides? Yeah, they were given free to the guides, so to, uh, we didn't have any help from the government for those masks. Uh, we paid them from our budget and also uh, through volunteer work to make the, those masks. So we, we, don't, we just had uh, 150 masks to make. It's not maybe a, a large project as in, in, in Spain where they had maybe a, a thousand to make. Yeah. Uh, Joan, what did you do in Spain with your masks? Did you um, finance it yourself or were you given the masks? They were pay we paid them. Mm -hmm. We had no financiation. Okay. They were all of them paid by, by us. Okay, great. Thanks, Esther. Um, I will continue to monitor the Q&A section and chat, and I will pose further questions to you a little later. Okay. Alushka, have you seen if the, uh, the guide from Malta has uh, made it to the session yet? And not yet. I will keep you updated in your chat. Malta okay, is then... present. Ah, is Malta present? Yeah, yes. right here, I think. Yeah. I've been there all the time. Ah, yes. We are tiny, so maybe that's why you don't see us from far away. <laughs> no, no, you are correct. Walter is there. You are correct. We even checked their slides. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad I asked. I wouldn't want to skip over our very important member from Malta who will start his presentation now, and I will give you a one-minute warning when, uh, well, when you have one minute left. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So my name is uh, Franz van Avnonk. I'm the president of the Malta Union of Tourist Guides, and I will start uh, sharing my screen presentation right now. Let me see. Oops. There it is. Can you all see it? Then I go on. So the uh, no, so the far, year was no screen sharing. There's no screen sharing, uh, then I have to get out from here. Um, I'll do it again. Why doesn't he want to go? It's not working. It was working before. I can't understand why it's not working now. Screen. You have to, when there's share screen coming, then you have to choose the desktop or the whole, yeah, now it's coming. Okay. That's it. That's it. Okay. So let's go to the full screen. It doesn't want to go full screen. 
there it is. Okay, so this year was meant to be a year to be remembered because this is the year that um, our union turned 40 years. So we had plans for a big party, uh, a marketing seminar, and we were working on uh, uh, tour tourism law proposals, um, planning a symposium and a lot of activities. But that all, of course, was cut short when mid-March the, uh, the country went um, in lockdown. We had just had our uh, AGM um, a few days before um, the notice came that the airport was going to be shut. So we had to change a lot of things. Um, the symposium um, was turned into an online event, which happened on the 25th of September. Um, all our council meetings became Zoom meetings. Um, it was impossible to, to meet um, people from different households in, in one room. Um, the country was on shutdown from mid-March till the end of June. Then it opened gradually. The, the airport was opened, the ports were opened, uh, but tourism only started trickling in. It was a, a matter of uh, individual travelers, not in large numbers. Um, this year we have had uh, quite a tumultuous year, but besides the, the problem with the COVID, we had also uh, changes in um, um, our government. The, uh, we got a new minister for tourism and um, when we had organized the, uh, the marketing seminar, which is, was aimed to get the guides, the, the tools to market themselves, because up till now, the marketing of, of guiding services is done through agents. Um, so a guide has to become an agent before he can market actually his own services. With the new law in, in, in mind, this was gonna be cha changed. So we said, we'll organize a marketing seminar, which we managed to do. And we had also the first uh, encounter with this new minister. But then the second meeting, where we would hammer out a number of, of, of issues that, that always uh, torment the guides, um, had to be cancelled because of the COVID. Um, it happened in the, in the end, mid-July, when, when things started getting back to normal. Uh, mind you, Malta was never a, a big hotspot. The, um, the numbers, especially in the first months, uh, remained in, in, in very, very low numbers. Uh, it is only now in the second wave that uh, we have sometimes 100, 200, even uh, new cases um, or positive cases uh, uh, found on, on a daily basis. Um, but it seems to be cooling down again. So we hope that um, there will be uh, a new future. Now, our plans regarding the law, of course, um, were also hampered by this fact that we couldn't meet in person uh, with, with the people that we, we needed to meet. So it was all of the meetings due uh, through, uh, through Zoom. Um, and although the minister wanted to have the new tourism law to go to parliament in October, um, to be honest, we are still discussing the details. There are, there are still uh, some loose ends, um, which were tying up. And in the meantime, um, yesterday, uh, a new minister um, for tourism was uh, presented and he took the oath. So I hope we will not have to start all over again, um, that we can continue on the, the, the path that we have um, set from the beginning of the year with the, the, the previous minister now, and um, that we keep on going. So the COVID, of course, meant that nobody had work. Um, very, very, very few people actually did work throughout the year and uh, we're always reduce, reducing uh, numbers. Currently, the maximum group size is five people, which is of course ridiculously low. But um, since the reopening of the airport in July, we have um, also seen a reopening of the, the port, the harbor for cruise liners. Um, Malta had similar figures to Italy, so it was considered to be one bubble. And um, MSC Cruises started um, first one and then later uh, two cruise liners uh, visiting the Malta port. Of course, to protect the, the guests, uh, guides have to be tested before every engagement. Um, there are very, very strict protocols. They can't even go uh, and, and dash off to have a coffee or, or to go and pee uh, during a tour. So it is, well, it's working, but it, it's, it's not um, that much. The maximum engaged number of guides for the, for this event for these cruise liners runs to, to about 60 people. 
but usually it's less. Now, to compensate for those who lost their income, um, we have in all on the island about 600 licensed guides. Um, 200, a good 200 of them are members of our association. The, uh, the government started um, presenting a support scheme. The first ideas were launched mid-March, mid just after the announcement of, of the, um, the shutdown, but it took a few weeks before uh, things fell in place. And in fact, the first payment uh, came by the end of April. Now the support comes to about 200 euros per week. Um, and it has been extended till next spring, or whether it will be end of March or maybe early April, that is still unclear. The cutoff date has not been uh, given. The, um, the support is available to all guides. So um, most guides in Malta are self-employed. Um, some work for one agency in particular, so they are on short-term contracts, but everybody uh, would qualify for this support scheme, even those who are actually on retirement pension. In the beginning, there was a bit of confusion about it. Um, some people were told, no, you can't uh, apply for it. In the end, it was settled. And um, in fact, a number of people have, besides their basic pension, also this support. Of course, it's not a lot. Um, it's, it's a few days of, of, uh, of work, really, what, what you get. Um, so, but it, it's a help to, to keep us going. So, um, Malta is also a destination for a lot of incentive and, and conference um, tourism, and all that has been cancelled throughout the year. And although some have been rebooked for the next year, um, we have to wait and see how that will develop. So, bookings for 2021 have come in. Um, we issued our uh, Union Diary uh, on time, and um, our, fir our first um, gathering for for guides that uh, is, is being organized is going to be at the end of this month, uh, coming Saturday, in fact, um, our traditional mass for those who have left us for better grounds, we hope. Um, I must say, till now, I am not aware that any guide has um, gone down with COVID. Uh, 19 at least has died from it. So for next year, we look forward to uh, have personal meetings again, because that is, of course, a uh, much more productive way than zooming around. We also hope for a restart of tourism. Malta had, as other countries have just presented, uh, been growing steadily for a number of years. And also the prospects for 2020 were presented early January um, by the uh, the tourism authority is very uh, promising that of course fell down like a, a ton of bricks um, once the, this uh, shutdown has been lifted we hope we can uh, resume our educational visits for all the members and um, definitely we hope to conclude the uh, the revision of the law proposals and when possible we'll organize the grandiose belated birthday party which we had to miss this year i uh, thank you for your attention well, thank you, friends. I was just about to say one more minute because okay. it gave you a little extra time because of the the delay with the uh, technical okay. problem sorry about that. in the beginning. Um, so this gives us a little extra time for questions first from uh, the other presenters. Okay. Who has something to ask of friends? Denmark has a question. Ask. <laughs> Um, you, you said that in September, or you wrote on the slides that in September you started seeing cruise ships coming in again. Yes. Has that affected the workload for the guides or how has, how has that worked? Um, a number of guides did work, uh, up to a maximum of 60, I, I was informed, uh, were engaged with, with this work. Uh, the group sizes were, of course, reduced drastically from a full coach, which usually takes about 50 people. Uh, first, it was reduced to half, then to 15, then to 10. Now it's at five. So five persons per guide. So it, it is quite expensive, I would say, for the, the, the uh, cruise company to organize these tours. And in fact, the number of people that are taking them is, is very low. We're talking about a few dozen for, from a, a big cruise ship with uh, hundreds of people on board. But it has given uh, at least some work to some people. Um, 
a working day starts about two hours before the tour starts with medical tests because everybody has to cert be certified every time that you have uh, an engagement that you're clean, you're free of COVID. Um, so some people have been tested a number of times, sometimes twice a week. Uh, being an Italian uh, cruise ship uh, company, of course, the language uh, range is far limited than normally because uh, it would be only accessible for Italian speaking people. So it, it would be only concerning Italian speaking guides. I hope that well, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, we will have time, I hope, at the end of all the presentations for uh, many more questions. In the meantime, let us move on to our next presenter. Do we have Namibia present? Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, Emiliano Benulic, uh, let me try. C can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can yes, hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Hello. I was trying to, I'm going to share now the presentation and sorry, it's just here. Okay. Okay, as I said, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm Emiliano Benulic and I'm a, an executive member of the Tour Guide Association of Namibia and also executive member of uh, Tour and Safari Association of Namibia. Uh, Namibia. Uh, Namibia is a Southern Africa country which is bordering with South Africa, uh, Botswana and Angola and also facing the Atlantic Ocean. So Namibia is pretty big uh, as a size because we're talking about 824,000 square kilometer, but the population is very scarce. We're talking uh, about only two and a half million population south. So is basically one of the lowest population density population in the world, I think the second after Mongolia. Uh, Namibia is also lying between two deserts, as you can see um, on, the, on the western side of the country, we got the Namib Desert, which is also the oldest desert in the world, while on the eastern side of the country, uh, we're having the Kalahari Desert. So it's basically a very dry country. Uh, in Namibia, we do have uh, two wall heritage sites. Uh, one is the uh, engravings, uh, the famous Twaifa Fountain rock engravings, more than 5,000 old rock engravings. And then the famous uh, Namib Sand Sea, which is lying on the Namib Desert. Uh, this is two of the main attraction of this not so known country. Okay, as, a, as a, an association, uh, we were created in 1994, uh, reaching now 26 year. Remember Namibia is also quite a young country because it obtained its independence from South Africa only in 1990. So the country itself, it's 30 years old because previously it was still part of South Africa. Uh, at this stage, the Tour Guide Association of Namibia uh, counts on about 140, 143 registered uh, overland guides, and also we have to count them uh, local guides and activity guides. Uh, the Tour Guide Association of Namibia uh, is committed to representing, promoting, and protecting and developing the association and its member interests as well as promoting and maintaining the highest standards of professionalism among its member. TAN is dedicated to representing the association and its member in dealings with government and other tourism related organization institution. TAN is open to all tour guides. Of course, we have criteria and we have selection and we have to study to become a guide. And uh, the organization is promoting definitely the advancement of Tourism. We have a proper code of conduct that all our members has to respect. And yeah, uh, as a small country, we keep on growing. Uh, tourism was pretty good uh, before COVID. And now we still have to see what we are facing. Remember that the, the first confirmed COVID cases, uh, COVID-19 case in Namibia was uh, reported in mid of March. 
And basically that killed our season because remember Namibia has basically two seasons, the dry season and the rainy season. The rainy season is starting around November and carries on up to April. So basically during the rainy season, we have less visitors while during the dry season, which is again from April onwards to November, we have the majority of our tourists coming and visit the country. Uh, basically the, uh, the season for this year never started, unfortunately. Uh, as we can see from the slide, the arrival from tourists it's, ex, was extraordinary in the past year, moving from 1.2 million in 2013 to over 1.5 in 2017. Uh, we still not have a clear figure for last year, but for sure uh, 2018 was also an excellent year. Uh, the government self uh, granted an, an emergency income uh, once off, unfortunately, of uh, 750 Namibian dollars, which is just to give you an example, the equivalent of 40 uh, euro of 50 US dollars, so quite low. Uh, we as an association then uh, started a different uh, program, one very interesting that was promoted and sponsored and also offered by uh, two guide association in Namibia was the COVID-19 training program. Uh, was very successful, well, we're talking about 450, 470 different guides who took part to this uh, very good program. We have to thank our chairman, which is Mr. Uh, Rolf Irish, and also, of course, one of the promoter of the course was uh, Mr. Edgar Nudia, that they are present and they were almost on each and every course present and to help and, you know, to, to fight this threat. Um, other than that, uh, we took part on different association, including tour guide association that we have to remember is still part of the bigger association, which is a, a FENATA, which is the umbrella association, which is including all the stakeholders, all the participants in the tourist world. So we, we took part of this uh, very interesting, uh, what to say, safe travels, which is a series of protocol that align the private sector behind common standards to ensure the safety of the workforce and travelers. So basically they, they are certifying that uh, the, a country is set as a destination respecting some protocols and some standards. And uh, uh, Safe Travels is now present in many, many uh, countries all over the world. And I hope it will become more and more present also in other countries, which is not still on the list. Uh, what I found it here that I hope it will work now, uh, we tried before, it's an amazing video uh, about the social impact of travel and tourism, and which is amazing. I'll try to start it now and hopefully, okay, it will start now. What does travel mean to you? What does travel mean to you? Exploring the world? Creating memories? Meeting new people? Disconnecting from it all? But what about making a difference? Because our travels mean so much more than we realize. And those memories we've created together in travel, they're even better than we thought. Remember that restaurant where you never felt so full? Know that when you paid your bill, changing travel is world changing too that photo you took on safari the one that hit new levels of likes your trip supported the tireless fight against the illegal wildlife trade remember that spontaneous city break it helped maintain schools in the local area and your tour guide the one who made you laugh so much she is one of millions of women employed in a sector leading in gender equality remember how you made a difference when you traveled Remember how much your travels meant to others. Now, just think of all the good you can do in the future.
difference. Thanks for the attention. So what I, what I find touching in this video, uh, unity uh, throughout all the people, we are all basically in, in the same storm on different boats, I would say. But yeah, unity, talking together, that initiative of uh, World Federation of Two Guard Association is brilliant for me. So please carry on and try to, yeah, getting through this storm. Miliano, uh, that was very enjoyable. Uh, the video was uh, made me want to just get out and go, but we know we can't right now and looking forward to the day when we can. We do have time for some questions. So who would like to be the first one? Well, yes. Oh, we do have somebody. Yes, again, me, <laughs> Christina. Um, hi, I would like to know if you had any uh, tourism at all, uh, because sometimes, you know, um, it, we have this feeling that it's zero, but did you feel like when, between the first wave and the second wave, did you have any kind of uh, visitors coming? And from where? Thanks. From South Africa? Thanks, Christina, for the question and was a great, a very good question. Uh, what I would say that Namibia is now open, so we're busy receiving tourists. Uh, we, we have to remember that the majority of uh, our tourists, they are international, so mostly Europeans and North Americans. So at this stage, we do have tourists, and I would add that Namibia is one of the safest destinations at the moment, just due to the, 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 the fact that the population is so low. So basically what happened after lockdown, uh, the government shut the, the airport, so we didn't have uh, tourists allowed to come. But again, now Namibia is open and slowly, uh, we hope that we're gonna get to a sort of normality soon or later, taking in consideration that, uh, okay, that the, the temperature, maybe the virus, we still don't know, but somebody says that doesn't like high temperatures and we do have, more than 300 days of sun per year. So that's one of the right place to be at the moment. And the fact, again, that the population is pretty scarce. You're not gonna see a lot of people when you visit in Namibia, despite the fact that maybe in the capital town that where we are and some other smaller town that you have more people, but usually you don't see a lot of people. So uh, answering again your question, Yes, we are receiving tourists, not so many at this stage, and uh, we all hope that there will be more in the next future. Thank you. It's because, of course, with such a scarce population, you cannot um, focus on domestic tourism yourselves, right? That's something that we are trying to do here, but probably you cannot do that. That's, that's the reason why I asked. Okay, and answering again, we, we, we had an initiative which was uh, uh, trying to help uh, local tourism, which is called local tourism is lecker. Uh, it helped a little bit. Of course, not the guides, but mainly establishment, hotels and lodges and, you know, car, car rentals, but not, not so much about guides at this stage. Well, your timing was perfect. And uh, we will have a chance at the end of the sessions to, uh, well, in the meantime, everybody can write down some questions or send them to our chat and we'll address them at the end. Meanwhile, we have Copenhagen, Denmark waiting in the wings for their chance. Please go Thank ahead. You so Thank you very much, Esther. And let me just start by sharing if i can get this to work hopefully you should all be able to see it now uh so thank you esther and thank you uh, world federation for having me um i am heidi and i am the president of uh, the association of qualified tourist guides in denmark and uh, 
I will uh, spend the next about 10 minutes just giving you a brief introduction to who we are and how we work. And then of course, on how COVID-19 has affected us in the last eight, nine months. It's easy to lose track of time with uh, COVID-19. Uh, so Denmark is uh, in the northernmost part of Europe. You can see us up on the top right corner in a circle, a really small country of just a little less than uh, 6 million people. Um, with a fairly mild climate, a big coastline and a lot of wind and a lot of rain. Uh, our association is primarily located in Copenhagen or we primarily work in Copenhagen, uh, which is the capital city of Denmark. And the association was founded in 1933. So we're one of the oldest associations in, uh, in the world. We currently have 261 members and we work in 26 different languages. And guiding is not a regulated profession in Denmark. Uh, so you don't need uh, any license, any authorization or any course that you need to pass to become a guide. Anyone can basically call themselves a guide. But if you wanna be a member of our association, you need to pass a one year diploma course at the University of Roskilde to get accepted into the, uh, to the association. Um, we currently have 15 people attending the course this year. So we are quite confident that uh, next year is gonna be a, a good year for us. Uh, the association is run on a voluntary basis with seven members in our board and two supplement members. And we have a number of committees uh, that are carrying out the, the different work that uh, has to be done. We have, always been a trade union, which means that we, uh, for many years, negotiated our tariffs through a collective agreement with the different, different travel agencies in, in Copenhagen. Uh, and this means that even if we all freelance and we are not um, permanently employed by the travel agencies, we are often paid on basically on an hourly uh, on an hourly basis, and it is the agency that will collect and uh, file our taxes for us. And that has proven well in some situation, but it has turned out to be a little bit of a problem for us uh, during COVID-19, unfortunately. And I'll get back to that a little later. We are a member of the World Federation, and we are also a member of FEG, which is the European Federation of uh, Tourist Guides Associations. Um, Tourism has never been a big part of the economy in Denmark. Um, that has changed over the last uh, 20 years, um, but, but historically or traditionally, we haven't considered it a big part of our economy. Um, we have, uh, or the, the primary part of our tourism is coastal tourism because, because we have so much coast. Uh, and the majority of the visitors we have in Denmark in general uh, are Germans who come to live in summer houses or come with their motorhomes or caravans. And they are typically not the type of tourists that would use a qualified guides uh, as, as we do. Um, in Copenhagen, of course, it's a little different because we're the capital city. So last year was a very good year for us. We had uh, almost 5 million international bed nights as they call it. The majority of the people that are passing through Copenhagen are either on different round trips uh, around Scandinavia, where they usually start in Copenhagen. And we have quite a lot of visitors coming in with cruise ships because uh, many of the cruises in the Baltic region will start or end in Copenhagen. Um, so, so 2020 was supposed to be a very good year for us, which I think was the case for most countries, from what I can hear also um, from the other presentations. And then when we got to the middle of March, COVID really hit us and the Danish government started shutting down the country. So at first all public employees were sent home and schools and restaurants and hairdressers and so on, everything was closed and the borders were closed uh, and we could not gather more than 10 people. 
our parliament was quite quick in negotiating and passing different kind of relief packages or financial aid schemes. Um, first and foremost, uh, schemes that would help all of the people that were furloughed and would help businesses with compensation for their fixed expenses. And then a little later on came the, the aid, the relief packages for freelancers and sole proprietors as, as the guides. Um, we haven't had anything in particular aimed at the guides, but we have been able to apply for the relief packages that all other freelancers and sole proprietors can, can, can apply under. And um, it was all based on, everything has been based on the income that we had last year. We had to prove that we had lost more than 30% of our income, which was quite easy because it was 100% for us. And we have been able to get up to 75% of our loss covered. <clears throat> However, a maximum of a little more than 3,000 euros per month. And <clears throat> so far that scheme has run out at the end of October and we don't really know uh, exactly what is going to happen over winter if we will get anything because tourism is very seasonal and usually we don't really have a lot to do in winter. Um, Copenhagen was was maybe hit double hard in a sense so borders started reopening in the middle of May but with uh, some restrictions uh, it was only three different countries or nationalities who were allowed into the country. And we had a so-called six-day rule where these three nationality could, nationalities could only enter the country if they had booked six nights minimum in Denmark. And Copenhagen was totally left out of that. So no tourists were allowed into the country until later on in the summer when this restriction was lifted. And since most of the visitors we have would stay for only two or three nights. We didn't really have any foreign tourists at all among the few nationalities that could enter. And on top of that, we have a ban on cruise ships uh, coming into the country. And that is so far in uh, um, still standing until I think the end of December and what will happen next year um, remains to be seen. So, so we've, we've been hit in, in, in many different um, on many different parameters in, in Copenhagen. Uh, so what have we done as an association? Well, early on, we started collecting data on cancellations and financial losses from our members, which was actually inspired by what, by what they have done in, in New York, in the New York Association. And uh, even if it doesn't give us a complete picture of how much loss our members have had, it did give us some, some numbers that we used when we wrote the different politicians. So we sent five letters in total to our government and our politicians to bring awareness to our situation. Um, and we did also get a response back and we were not, it wasn't because we thought we could get specific help for the guides, but we wanted to be sure that we were among the organizations that would push for having aid to all of the freelancers and sole proprietors that we have in the country. Uh, so we spend a lot of time corresponding with government and politicians. And um, even if we haven't perhaps made a big change, we were quite happy to see that in summer, for instance, government did pass a special summer package where a sum of money was set aside for retirement homes uh, and senior citizens homes to do tours with tourist guides. Uh, they weren't informed, the retirement homes, uh, that they could do this. They, uh, so, so we didn't really get anything out of it, but, but uh, we do think that our letters did have some effects. We haven't done any special protocols on how to guide with COVID-19. First of all, we haven't had any tourists. Second of all, the Danish authorities are in general quite good at establishing the protocols and the rules and guiding falls under the general restrictions on public gatherings. So at the moment, we can only be 10 people together and that goes for guiding as well, whereas all tourist buses are under the same restrictions as public transport. So, so we haven't worked on that. Heidi, one more minute, please. Yes, thank you. So instead, we have been um, we've been following a new saying of uh, while we are waiting, we are learning. 
Uh, we have a so-called study tour committee, uh, which has been organizing a lot of extra training for us. Our training committee has also launched a special course in collaboration with uh, one of the museums in Copenhagen, which is something we hope we can expand to other institutions. So we have basically spent our time learning and improving uh, and upgrading our qualifications, basically, because that's the best way we feel good for us to, to go around this. Future, we don't know. We are starting to see people leaving the association either because they find work in other businesses and they have to because they do need to pay rent. And we do see some of our elderly members uh, retiring um, for good. So we'll have to see what happens in the future. Hopefully we will all be able to travel again soon. Uh, it's maybe just a matter of under which circumstances. Thank you, Esther. That's all for me. Well, thank you, Heidi. We are going to move right into our next presentation, and that will be Portugal. Please. Okay, so now I've unmuted myself. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Cristina, and I am the president of the Portuguese Tourist Guide Association. So now I'm going to share my screen with you. Wait, because I need to... Oops, push this from the beginning. Wait, wait. Why is it not working? <laughs> God, I just wait. Hmm. All right, so it was working before, right? <laughs> Let's yes. start again. Let's start again. Play it from the beginning. Well, first of all, of course, um, the same happened in Portugal as uh, everywhere in the, in the world from March onwards. So this is the beginning. From March onwards, the cancellation started falling. And um, in the association, which I am the president, it's called, by the way, the Portuguese Association of Tourist Guides and Tour Managers. Uh, we are the second largest association in Portugal because there is um, another association much older than ours and our fellow uh, guides from um, SNATI. We had to work together in putting up programs for the um, COVID pandemi pandemia and we did a lot of work at the very beginning together and we carry on that work together because at the very early stage and we did have some inquiries on um, sent to our members online as early as the first week in April as to their work situation. And we realized by the first week of April that 85% um, of uh, the um, association members were without any work at all. Uh, of course, we forwarded that um, uh, the, 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 the results of the um, of the, uh, the inquiries to our state secretary of um, tourism and also to the health departments, national health, health departments, and we are we are able to establish at a very early stage uh, a protocol with the um, national tourism board in order to create uh, a, a security uh, protocol for tourist guides at that stage the tourism office which is called Tourism de Portugal was putting up a series of protocols for different establishments uh, hotels restaurants, restaurants and so forth but we were able uh, to uh, focus their attention on the problem of tourist guides. We needed to have some protocols with, which would ensure guides to know what to do in case of themselves falling sick during um, a, a tour or one of their uh, clients and also um, how to trigger the um, the policy the, the, the health the, the health policy measures so we we did these protocols we worked a lot during april and we were able to have the first trainings uh, by mid-may this because of course we all were assuming that by july august uh, the borders would be open again, which they did. They did open in at the beginning of July, first with our neighboring country, Spain, and then to the rest of Europe. And we were assuming, of course, that um, for the second half of the year, uh, there wouldn't be a second wave as, or it wouldn't eat us as hard as the first uh, wave. So we were trying to, to um, make ourselves ready for um, for work uh, during summer. So this um, 
the, this protocol was really very interesting. I'm going to uh, open the link to our um, to the uh, website of the National Tourism Board. It's called Clean and Safe, and um, people may access through the Portuguese Tourism Board our uh, own uh, association um, website. And in the association website, if you um, you know, open the lists members, and if you click at random in one of them, you'll be able to find the um, clean and safe certificate for that person. So uh, guests will know that we have followed those protocols and the protocols, uh, of course, are also listed in the website, both ours and the Portuguese uh, Tourism Board. Um, so this was really very important uh, for us. Um, but very early, we, uh, of course, at the beginning, we did find uh, some work, at least colleagues that were working in the north of the country, especially in the, in the river cruises. And during the summer months, July and August, there was some work over there, but we very soon realized by uh, as early as beginning of July that there wouldn't be any real uh, tourism coming. And when we had the second inquiry launched, um, we realized that most of our members, we have 237 members, um, they had cancellations from, I mean, the work that they had anticipated um, in their agenda for the summer months, by the beginning of July, all of, of most of that, 85% was cancelled. So then we tried to focus on, this is something, of course, that everybody know, we tried also to, um, uh, to make sure that international, at the international level, level, our association would be known and we registered, of course, for the Safe Travels uh, World uh, WTTC uh, protocols and also for uh, some others. But we very, very, very early uh, realized that we needed to focus on domestic tourism. So we launched a program which is called Quality Tours by Certified Guides. This is also a new website. And um, in this new website, these are signature tours. So we asked our, our, our members to come up with ideas. Um, because, of course, we are, are all certified guides. We had a three-year training. And most of us have their own specific um, knowledges. So we asked them to, um, uh, to come up with ideas as to um, you know, um, launch new new uh, products for domestic tourism. And this is what we came up with. Of course, uh, we aimed at uh, domestic um, tours, which is Portuguese on this side. But of course, these programs are also in different languages. And these are all um, signature tours. So tours that our um, members themselves developed. And uh, they can be look at this one, Lisbon as a spy nest. This is a colleague. Uh, she's doing this for Portuguese, uh, Portuguese people at the moment. And it's about you know, the Second World War in Lisbon and all the spies that uh, came through Lisbon. So ideas such as this, which are very val valid. And um, with these ideas, we were able to um, launch some um, products for the domestic public. So we went on promoting our own signature tours through official websites. Our tourism board, uh, Turismo de Portugal, which is a national tourism board, has a program, call, a program called Visit Portugal for Portuguese. So we are promoting over there, but also mailing lists. Uh, partnerships, we came up with new partnerships, including with um, the uh, University of Lisbon. Um, so now we also have some training with the, uh, with the technicians from the University of Lisbon. They um, manage the botanical gardens, for instance, and the um, Museum of Science. So now we have protocols with them that we can also tour um, in their own uh, private museums. And also we launched an online magazine um, 
So this is the English version, but it's most mostly targeted for the Portuguese market. So there's a Portuguese version. And in this one, the English version, of course, uh, there's, um, oh God, no, I have, uh, okay. So there's the, 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 this is the protocol in English. So uh, we, we actually send this to you, WFTGA, and to the WFTGA members, but also to different uh, associations all over the world and also tour agents and DMCs. So they, will, they are aware in English of the protocols that we needed to go through. Um, and, um, and also uh, it, it tells you a little bit about what we are doing as an association and uh, a little bit about Portugal. So we are working very hard on this online magazine to make our work known to the general public and also to our partners, both in Portugal and abroad. Um, and this has, this has worked pretty, pretty well. We had about 5,000 readers in the English magazine and about 3,000 in the Portuguese uh, version of the magazine. So we are very happy with the results. Um, and also we are, of course, like everybody else, are trying to uh, spend time wisely promoting webinars uh, amongst others, you know, like uh, how to put up visual, <laughs> virtual uh, tours. There are some colleagues doing that. I know that Katya is listening to this um, presentation and she's one, she has been a moderator to our webinars, how to come up with or to put on a virtual uh, tour, but also we are having Christina, very... one minute, please. This is finishing. Uh, very soon, uh, the um, the annual convention is coming up, and in the annual annual convention, one part, uh, a whole day. This is the program. Our president Telushka has been invited, and just because you know, you can read digital, digital, digital. So a whole uh, a whole day will be dedicated to this new. Uh, ways of communicating through digital platforms. So and that's all about me. Thank you for listening and I'm open for questions if you have some. Thank you. Well, we are actually need to move on to our next presentation, but at the end, as uh, we've mentioned before, uh, we will have a question and answer period uh, to cover everyone as long as we keep to our, our time schedule. Now we have the Guides Association of New York City from USA. Michael, please. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Morgenthal. I'm the Vice President of the Guides Association of New York City. Greetings from the Big Apple. Um, our, uh, our association president presented uh, to the WFTGA at the previous version of this, and she asked me to come back and talk specifically about one program that we put into place. So let me get my presentation started here. Okay, so just a bit of background about GANIC. Uh, we were founded in 1974 as the Multilingual Guides Association of New York City. So our initial focus was on non-English tours. Uh, we changed the name to Gannick in 1979, but we still have uh, tours uh, that are given in over 30 different languages. Uh, currently, we have 382 active members, and that's actually up from 330 since the end of 2016. We also have 26 active industry partners, which we're very proud of as well. Uh, here's the best looking board in New York City. Um, mm -hmm. So these are the people who have been doing all the, the really hard work for us at, uh, at the association. Um, March 12th was a day that we became, that became known as Red Thursday in our business here. I'm sure it's very similar to people uh, all around uh, the world working in tourism, but that was the day when everything kind of came crashing down. Uh, and after the initial shock of that, we started discussing, of course, not knowing how long-term the pandemic would be, but we started discussing what might help uh, alleviate this. Uh, you heard uh, my colleague Heidi from Denmark, she referenced our tracking of canceled tours. We did that, which certainly helped us garner some aid uh, from government, not for us, but for freelancers in general. Uh, there's not specific aid for the tourism industry here in New York or in the United States, but these were some of the stats. But basically, like everybody else, we quickly figured out that um, the local market would perhaps be our first step towards recovery once uh, everything started bouncing back from a health standpoint. Uh, this is certainly not news to all of you, but I just wanted to share this one statistic that just came out 
last week from our DMO, New York City and Company, NYC and Company. Uh, so this shows what the projections are in New York over the next several years. Um, international tourism down from a uh, projection of, of 13.5 million in 2019 to only 2.4 million in 2020. And the vast majority of that would have been in the first couple of months of, the, of 2020. Um, and so domestic tourism, even though the numbers are down, is going to be uh, the way to go. And then uh, through US Travel, uh, the US Travel Association, uh, they commissioned a couple of marketing agencies who asked uh, several questions. This one we thought was pretty interesting. Um, people are changing their destinations from uh, places that they can fly to, to places they can drive to. And uh, this obviously research has been uh, pretty well established for several year, uh, several months now. Uh, but these numbers just came out again uh, just in the past week or two. So it kind of confirmed the plan that we came up with, which was to uh, start promoting our tours to the local New York air audience. Now, unlike our friend in Namibia or other places around the world, um, we're blessed to have 30 million people within driving distance of New York City. So it seemed like a slam dunk to really market it. Um, but we had a, a challenge in that our association's website, which you're looking at right here, is really focused in terms of what we send out to the public at large on specific tour guides, not on specific tours. Uh, in fact, we have a find a guide section where you can find an appropriate guide for you and perhaps create a custom tour. But we quickly realized that what was gonna to appeal to the local markets were niche tours. You know, uh, As much as locals would like to see the Statue of Liberty in Times Square, they're much more apt to be interested in uh, kind of secret neighborhoods in Brooklyn or Queens or, or things like that. So that yielded about four months worth of work, which led to this website, which I'll run through in just a second, called Tour Your Own City. This is just the screenshot, but I'll, I'll show you the website in just a second. Um, and uh, we decided to launch it as a separate entity from our regular website to allow for uh, increased marketing opportunities uh, in, in reaching out, uh, and also to allow some flex flexibility in terms of what this eventually would be. We didn't want to completely redo our association website while we were kind of trying uh, this test program. Uh, one thing that I'll mention before I start going into the website, which I'll run, run through uh, quickly with you guys, uh, is um, every guide who submits a tour for Tour Your Own City has to, agree, has to agree to adhere to GANIC's specifically developed uh, health and safety protocols, which you can see here on the site. Uh, we developed three different sets of protocols uh, that we share, one for tour guides, one for tour operators, and one for the general public. And they all share similar information, although the one for the tour guides is obviously more specific. Uh, but this way, uh, locals and everybody else who can take the tours uh, would feel comfortable that we are uh, certainly have their, their best interests in mind. Uh, once the site launched in late August, we did a fairly aggressive media campaign uh, on the left, uh, that's me in the blue shirt and our, our treasurer, Jeremy Wilcox, in the tan shirt. We we're being interviewed by a local New York uh, television channel um, uh, and the reporter in there, she shared this photo. She said it looked like um, an emo rock album cover from the 1990s, so I thought that was kind of cool. But uh, that was the main way of us getting it out there was both through uh, local press and, um, and also um, uh, social media. So what I'd like to do is actually share the website with you and kind of run you through it real quick. If I can find uh, the right, here we go. Okay, so um, this is the site. Like I said, it took us about three or four months to get it up. It's called Tour Your Own City. Um, you can search for tours in a number of ways. Number one, tours are broken down by borough. So the vast majority of them are in Manhattan, but we do have tours in every borough except for Staten Island. And uh, basically this program was open primarily to our membership, uh, but we did allow non-members to contribute as well. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But we're, we've had 125 tours uploaded to the site. You can start to see the variety here from neighborhood tours like Gramercy Park, theme tours like the Civil War, uh, the subway, uh, Abraham Lincoln in New York, um, you name it, very kind of niche tours. And then uh, basically, if people click, if the members of the public click on the site, this is not a booking engine, it's just a portal. And descriptions are provided. And then 
you would click as a member of public to book directly through the tour agency. So this one is Joyce Gold. She's one of our uh, elder statesmen, so to speak, amongst tour guides in New York. Uh, and we did this for a couple of reasons. Number one, we didn't want to get involved in the issue of booking. And number two, uh, we wanted to kind of make this direct booking so that there was no fees paid to OTAs or things like that. So uh, we've been pretty fortunate in having our guides uh, participate pretty actively. Um, in addition, um, as I said, uh, you see the button here that says submit a tour. As we said, we open this program up to non-GANIC members as well. We have about over 3,000 licensed guides in New York City alone. Uh, so we only about a little more than 10% of those are members of our association. Uh, so we offered to the non-GANIC members that for a one-time fee, the, the, to participate for our members is free, but for non-members, for a one-time fee, they could upload their tours. Uh, and that fee would be... Um, applicable to the uh, initiation fee if they decide to apply for membership within our association uh, within a few months. Right now it says October 31st, I need to update that. Um, and a few have taken advantage of that. We've had three or four who've actually signed up. So it's helped us keep uh, the association in the forefront, not just of the public's minds, but also other tour guides minds as well. Um, and uh, we've done that with some other programs like our job fair, and it's a way for us to really prove our value to the local guides where, where we don't receive any funding from a department of tourism or government associations or anything like that. Uh, so everything is funded by our membership and we're in the process of renewing right now, which, uh, which is we're all anxiously watching what our renewals uh, are gonna look like. So just back on the homepage, in addition to searching by borough, there's also a search feature here where you can search by themes so not too different from any other kind of booking software, but uh, we wanted to try to make this as user friendly as possible. So I just typed in street art here and we'll see what pops up. You see all the different uh, tours that feature street art in New York City. And this is from all over the five boroughs. So I know what your next question is, has this program been successful? Uh, and the answer is it hasn't been quite as successful as we hoped. Uh, in terms of conversions. We've had uh, a fair amount of web traffic, but we've only heard anecdotally of several tours being, or visits being converted to actual tours. But part of this was a PR campaign, right? This wasn't just about getting guides work, that was our ultimate goal, but more so we wanted to have the idea of guiding in the front mind uh, of lots of different people um, from all around the New York City area. Like I said, we're blessed to have so many people within driving distance of the city. Uh, so we're planning on having another big push in the spring where basically our season will come to an end with Christmas, uh, such as it is. There are a few people giving tours out there right now. It's certainly not nearly as busy as it normally is, but we're anticipating that things are gonna slow down and shut down again with the second wave. Uh, so for the spring, we're anticipating that we're still gonna need the local market very heavily, and we'll probably invest in some uh, paid media at that point. Uh, to this point, we've only done the social media, which I want to show you next, uh, because it turned out pretty, uh, we, we've had a pretty robust uh, social media campaign on Facebook. Uh, sorry, my internet's going a little slow, but this is our Facebook campaign here. Michael, there's one minute. One minute. Okay, so let me just show you the Instagram page, because that's the most impressive. Oh, that's Twitter, sorry, I'm pressing on the wrong key. Um, but the bottom line is we thought this was a proactive way for us to get the word out about guiding locally. And uh, we've gotten some press coverage from it and uh, we've gotten support from our DMO, uh, New York NYC and company and some other places, but we really hope that this ramps up in the spring. And here's our Instagram feed featuring a whole bunch of different tours. And then oh, there's some, some, New York, uh, some New York specific occasions like the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Uh, so overall, we thought this was a, a shot worth taking. It cost about $2,000 total from our association budget, and we're hoping it'll yield bigger results. So with that, I will stop the share and turn it back to Esther. Thank you, Michael. I'd like to ask Galushka if Kazakhstan has joined us in the meantime. Uh, we it do looks we do have Zanar from Kazakhstan. 
with us? Yes. Oh, that's great. Uh, this good, good. Your evening, turn. Good day to Hello. everyone. Uh, I'm from Kazakhstan, and uh, we have opened our association very recently. So I'm very much sorry for not. Pre uh, we couldn't prepare this uh, presentation. We tried actually, but due to some technical problem, we couldn't. So let me just uh, introduce for the few words about Kazakhstan. Uh, we just opened this association because uh, we have uh, a lot of guides and we wanted to uh, kind of regulate it, the activity of guides uh, in order to join everyone and also to protect our rights. And uh, due to COVID, actually, our association activity has been stopped for a while, but also, very recently, we uh, try, we we have made one very big event. To uh, we invited all our guys, and we start making the info tours for the different regions because Kazakhstan is a very big country, is the ninth largest country, and uh, we have due to COVID, uh, we have increased the number of domestic travels. Mm -hmm. So. All our guides are located in different regions of the country and we uh, kind of shared our experiences and also we opened up new routes and uh, new travel destinations for the local domestic tourists. So uh, with this activity, we try to a little bit um, like um, Come, uh, come over with this COVID situation because we don't have international tourists as well the, due to this uh, reason. And uh, also we uh, starting these um, courses for the guides because for the association, our main goal is to have certified professional guides because uh, like uh, with the Soviet Union collapse and everything with this independence, even when we had this very different, uh, difficult period of independence, uh, this question of tourist guides were not that much regulated. So again, thank you very much for letting me, uh, for being there with you to listen to all this, to see these wonderful presentations. And thank you very much. Well, we thank you very much. And hopefully at some time in the future, you'll be able to share more information with us. Yes. Now, may we have the Association of Tour Guides from Andorra. Hello, can you hear me? Can you all hear me properly? Yes, we can. Yeah. Well, good morning to some of you and good afternoon to people from Europe. My name is Isabelle Eiffelin. I'm the vice president of our association. Our association is called ACTA, which is in Catalan, which is the national language of Andorra. And me, it means the official association of tourist guides of Andorra. So our association was created 17 years ago in 2003, and we only 25 members. Uh, I don't know if you all know where Andorra is exactly. It's between France and Spain. So we're in the middle of the Pyrenees. And the only access to Andorra is by two roads from Spain or from France. So we don't have airports and we don't have train stations either. Okay, that, I think that's quite important, like a little bit of an island in the middle of the Pyrenees. Uh, the actual population of Andorra is about 77,000 inhabitants. 48 percent are Andorans, they've got Andorran passport, and the rest of us are what we call residents. People immigrate in Andorra to work with tourism mainly. So 60% uh, of our economy is tourism. So we used to be a, a farmer land, but little by little after the Second World War, tourists starting to arrive. And last year, we received about 8 million visitors in Andorra. Now, mainly these people come for shopping, then for skiing. The ski season is very important here in Andorra. And nature, because we've got the mountains and culture as well. 
So uh, I should say that 80% of the active population of Andorra, is, their job is directly related to tourism. So um, our association, we usually employed by uh, uh, incoming agencies. Now our season usually is from April till the end of November. And usually we are employed mostly by these agencies. Now, most of us, uh, the, the, the employers pay our social security. Only very few of us are self-employed. Self now we also get work be with the local tourist, the tourism office. And we are recommended also by Andorra Tourism, tourism which is the, like, uh, the official site of Andorra. If you want to uh, learn to more, more about Andorra, if you look at on the website, uh, visit Andorra and you get lots of information with that. And again, I'm, I'm sorry not to have put a PowerPoint as well. I was not really prepared for that. So we started here the, the COVID-19, uh, 2nd of March. One lady was affected and unfortunately died from that. And uh, just a few days later, on the 14th of uh, March, we were all locked down and the borders were closed. Only people with health problems had to go to the hospital in Barcelona or Toulouse could cross the border or the, we can, uh, we could bring goods to us. Thanks God for that, because we don't really grow anything in Andorra, except tobacco, I don't know if you know about it. And uh, uh, all public establishments were closed, only like basic stores, pharmacies and pistol stations were open. So um, the border with France was open on the 1st of June and the border with Spain was open on the 21st of June. So first for 75 days, we didn't have any tourists at all. So Andorra went down to 20% of, um, of the normal economy. So what happened? People like um, most of us, because we are seasonal workers, we didn't have a job at all, and we didn't get help from the government either. Um, now, people were employed for the first time in the history of Andorra, got economical help, just like in Spain, it's called ERTO, you know, so the government helped to pay these employees, but it was not our case, you know, we didn't, uh, and we, because the, the borders were closed, we couldn't get work at all as tour guides. Now, what we under the under government decided to do, and I think it's the first country to have done it, is they started on the 27th of April, and they decided to test the whole population twice. So they ordered 150,000 tests, and we were all tested like this. Now, uh, at the end of June, mid-June, we had zero case in Andorra. We had zero case. So the Andorran government promoted Andorra as a coronavirus free country. And when the borders uh, opened again, we got lots of tourists actually, July, August, September, we got 2 million visitors over the summer. But unfortunately, all the, because we mainly group with, uh, mainly work with our groups, all the groups were canceled. We are coming with coaches from mainly from France and Spain, because these are our uh, normal clients. Now we also get people from all over the world, but not as many as French people or Spanish people. So um, at the end of being of September, while well, the second wave, like the rest of Europe, hit us again, you know, like same. And of course, the cases grew up very quickly. And uh, now from the beginning, we were in public places where to wear a mask. And soon after, everywhere in the street, we had to wear a mask as well. Um, now, if you were going for mountain activities in the summer, it was not compulsory. So in September, when the, the children went, went, went back to school and all the, the teenagers, that's really when the second wave arrived in Andorra. So at the moment, at the present time, uh, we've got, we are over 6,000, well, of cases but active cases, about 1,000. Now, during a, a time, Andorra was consider, considered like a high-risk country. And some countries like uh, UK, I think Switzerland as well, 
wouldn't recommend to people to come to Andorra. So what the, the government has decided to do, the Andorran government, they decided to test the whole population every week. It's free. We don't have to pay for anything, you know? And uh, like this, they, they know exactly where it comes from and they've got trackers all the time. They've employed 100 trackers to know exactly uh, who had the uh, COVID or who had been in contact with the COVID. And uh, in this case, people are locked up. So our situation this summer, we had no work. We had no work. In my case, because uh, for the last three years, I've been working with the official touristic bus of Andorra. Usually I work for, from the 1st of June till the end of October. So this year they decided to try the experience and we started 1st of June till the end of September. What did we do? They decided to, to instead of filling the bus with people, up to 45 percent, it was limited to 20 persons. Now, of course, when people were on the bus, they had to wear the mask, and we always alcoholic gel at the entrance. Now, we could visit museums, there was no problem, but the visit in a museum, usually they are limited to 25 persons, they were limited to six persons. So all the protocols were really respected. Now, two of our members were employed by um, local uh, tourist offices, and uh, all the other ones are, are to find another job. So they're doing things that some of them haven't done before. So it is a problem. It is a problem. As you may know, Andorra, in Andorra, we don't pay much tax. I don't know if you know, knew about that. And because we don't much pay much tax, we don't get many help from the government. And in that case, we didn't get help at all. Now, although in Andorra, we've got uh, what we call survey d'occupation, it's like it would be an un unemployment agency. And after 45 days with no work, you can claim some help from the government. But you must be like in a almost critical economical situation, to get that help, you know? So it's not, it's not really easy. Um, what else? Now, uh, on the 31st of October, Spain, well, Cat uh, Catalonia, which are, you know, like uh, Juan said before, in uh, Spain, you've got 13 different regions. So the one closest to us and the border is with Catalonia. So they decided that uh, the lockdown, the shutdown, so the people from Catalonia are not coming anymore. You know, France, same thing on the other side. At the moment, it's not official yet, but it should be till the 18th of December. So at the moment, we've got no tourists at all, but we are, we are not locked down. So we can live a normal life with the mask and the gel and the protocol, you know. But because we've got no tourists, almost all the, all the hotels in Andorra are closed, shut down at the moment. Uh, we are, in Andorra, we've got 250 hotels. Uh, Isabel, one minute, please. Yes. So lots of people, I mean, in Andorra, we always had work in the last years. If you would lose, uh, find, I mean, leave a job, you could find another one. At the moment, there are 1,000 people, which is not much, but we only 77,000 inhabitants are unoccupied. So they've got no work at all. Now, we are preparing at the moment, uh, the Andorran government is preparing the, the winter season. We don't know when we're going to be able to open the ski resorts. At the moment, there is no snow. So please send us some snow from the States. Yes, that would be really nice. Please, or from Canada. And, uh, but they've already established a good protocol. For, at the moment, they'll be able to open the, 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 the ski slopes. Now, also what we've done uh, as the association, well, not, we haven't done a lot, to be honest. We created our Facebook page. We also put on the Visit Andorra page, uh, uh, we organized um, in the summer some like uh, walking tours, guiding tours, but it was not really successful, to be honest. Uh, what else? Well, we, we are in touch with each other to see, we, we support each other to see each other, how it's going for each of us, you know? 
Well, Isabel, it's so good of you to share this information with us. And now we are going to hear from Slovakia. So you can I just say one thing? One thing. Yeah, it's a second. I just want to congratulate all the other participants because their presentations were very good. I agree. Thank you very much for listening to me. You're quite welcome. And uh, do we have Marianne available now? So hello and good afternoon from the Central Europe. My name is Marianne and I prepared a short presentation about our association. You can start in a couple of the seconds. Actually, now. I'm representing Slovak uh, Tourist Guide Association. It's me, but uh, uh, shaved uh, and now unshaved until the Christmas Eve. I got the new role. I am the Santa starring, but until Christmas Eve only. And uh, I am from Slovakia, which is the, actually the country in central part of the Europe. Uh, if we compare the area and the population, I am so very lucky we have here the Denmark. The Denmark is the same size and the same population, but our hills are just a little bit higher and no seacoast in Slovakia. Uh, we are the eastern part of the formerly Czechoslovakia with a lot of the uh, very uh, similar and common part of the heritage of the guide system. We are not so far from Vienna, not so far from Budapest, not so far from uh, Krakow. We are actually in the center of the Europe. Uh, this is the view to our capital city, Bratislava, uh, is uh, on the Danube River, and we are a country between the Danube River and the High Tatras. This, uh, the High Tatras is the northern part of our country, but uh, back to our association. Our Slovak Tourist Guide Association was established in, in 2003. We survived 17 uh, years and uh, at the moment uh, we have 212 members like the qualified tourist guides in Slovakia and we are serving in 18 languages. Uh, very, uh, very soon after the establishment of our organization, we joined the World Federation of Tourist Guides. Uh, then uh, we joined the FAC, like the European Federation, but we left the FAC in 2011. The reason was very simple. The agenda and uh, the kind of the dealing with the agenda not satisfied us. We are the member of the Bratislava Tourist Board, which is the tourist board in the most populated city. And we are the associate member of Slovak Tourist uh, Travel Agents and uh, Asso uh, Travel Association. Maybe about the profession of tourist guide in Slovakia. Slovakia is a regulated country. Uh, the training of the tourist guide is running uh, according to the European standard of EN 15565. We have uh, the rules of the European Union for the free, for the free moving uh, and providing of the services. Um, in Slovakia, we have just a little bit more than 200, uh, uh, sorry, 2,000 certified tourist guides. 600 of them are very active, partly like the tour managers too, and 212 of them are our members. Uh, if you see uh, the structure of the profession, uh, the third is uh, the full professional working tourist guide, like the self employees. The next third are the people with their own job or like the employees are working in the part-time jobs and uh, the last third is working only occasionally. This was the true, but uh, until COVID age started. What can uh, so, uh, association like uh, Slovak Tourist Guide Association offer for our uh, colleagues is uh, the mostly the uh, very interesting thing, the information service. I recognize uh, that people need the basic information about the standards, ab about the, uh, the all the rules for business. We have the job market. Uh, we are serving uh, the lot of the providers and stakeholders. We have the own website. Uh, in this COVID age, we started our lectures via Zoom. We created a guidepedia. Uh, this is the part of a website. We collect the, uh, the paragraphs or uh, the uh, uh, experience 
of our colleagues. This is something very similar like Wikipedia, but this is not so uh, not so, not so huge at the moment. Marian, yes, uh, we still see the. Um... Uh, the normal view of PowerPoint, not the presentator view. Mm -hmm. Start it again. Yes, uh, we saw it or we... Just with, click at the button at full screen. To, down, down to the right. Yeah, that You You saw the, uh, the presentation, but... Not the full screen, just what we see now. Or mm -hmm. can you start once again from the beginning? Or yeah, now that's better. It's 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 better. Okay, so yeah. this is this is our this is our uh, this is the view. I think the the most important part was given uh, in the facts. Uh, this is the view to our website in four languages. The next four are prepared for the future. Uh, this is maybe the one of the very important and very often visited parts. This is the guide list. You can see the languages uh, and the all um, licenses and the certificates here. It's something like the uh, business card of our members. And uh, we started now in the, this year, the strategy 2020, 2030. What is this? Uh, Q and Q, qualified and qualification. We covered with this part of our website, the very important thing. Check everything. The qualification of Priskite uh, will be approved by uh, our organization. We uh, check the uh, language certification, the business rules, the registration number, VAT numbers. And uh, the very important thing is the people which get this label of the quality and qualification issued by the, our association uh, must be dealing with the conduct uh, code of the conduct. And we have the per permanent education system. Uh, what uh, is the, the an advantage? This is something for the tourist guides, like an advantage. It's for the consumer and for the clients. It can be the travel agents or travel agencies. Uh, we support traditional at the International Tourist Guide Day in Slovakia in this year, uh, 17 time uh, in the whole history. Uh, we offered the tours in 20 cities of around of the whole country, near to 700 guides, and so we served near to 25, more than 25,000 visitors. We got in this year, this, uh, this UFO is the observation desk and restaurant in, on the new bridge in the capital city, if you go with the uh, culture card, you can get only the elevator for the 50% discount or except the 21st of February is always for all tourist guides with the badge completely for free. This is the contribution. We uh, provided the free tours during the World Tourism Day. Yes, was possible in this year too, the, maybe about the in of uh, the uh, COVID age. Uh, yes, uh, the cancellation near to 90% lockdown in Slovakia in two waves. We completely closed the country in March. Uh, the infection was in the Slovakia not so big. This uh, finished in June and then came really the season for the English speaking guides. The season in Slovakia finished before it's really started. And we are now partly uh, uh, locked down, uh, but now this was open with the beginning of the November. Why? Uh, the first weekend in November, mass testing. We tested during the two days uh, from the population of 5 million near to 4 million people. And in the case of this, we can find where are the problem areas. We uh, understood that this year is the domestic market very important for us. Yes, we offered partly the tours for free for the locals, but we cannot substitute the income of the international tourism. Only in this case, if we can increase the consumption of the Slovak people 500 times, which is, which is really the not to do. But we uh, provided the tours for free, like the part of the education campaign to, to present our profession. Health and safety policy, yes, uh, we uh, collaborated in this area with the travel agents and with the cruises. Uh, what was very positive of the negative, the size of the groups uh, with the, the consumption of the tours uh, up to 25, like the maximum. This was two times up to three times more like during the regular tours. 
In the case of this was not so bad. Sanitize the hands, mask and the social distance. Yes, this is this. Tourism in Slovakia is not so very important. These are near to 404% uh, of the GDP, but the hospitality and tourism in Slovakia are 400,000 uh, of employees. Uh, we recognize, unfortunately, until the November 1st, lost uh, one third of our tourist guides, uh, the mood to be uh, the tourist guide more and uh, move to the another profession. We supported our colleagues in Hungary during the flash mob uh, in, in June and in Czech Republic. We must say that uh, the neighbor countries, their position is very, very bad. In Slovakia, we have the this is the first aid in Slovak, and uh, we have the government support. Uh, we have two kinds to take the money. The first one is from the uh, Ministry of the Labor and Social Affairs. Uh, for the first uh, six months uh, was the consumption or the compensation for every of the self-employees, 540 euros per month. This finished uh, on the September 30, but the good news, we started with the new structure of the same first eight plus and the tourist guides, I know uh, our aim is to work. This is our pleasure, this is, this is our thrill, but uh, the new compensation from the government is near to 810 euros. Uh, this Marian, is, uh, Marian, you may have one more minute, please. Yes. And uh, in the, the second wave, we have the 10% the of the de minimis. Uh, in the case of this, it's very simple. You can take in the next three years, if you, if you, if you is your business sustainable, uh, uh, near to 10% of your total income. In the case of this, you can see uh, it's in 10, 70, and 20 percent. Now, uh, about the programs, uh, yes, a uh, very good example is the program covered by Sebastian Denu of Moldavia. We uh, uh, applied for Erasmus together with our Czech and Hungarian colleagues for this. The, I think the world changed, and we must really the change everything. We must be more active. We are not only in the waiting room, the networking, and we are preparing the restart for May 2021 with the new communication, experience exchange, and cooperation and management contribution promotion. And like uh, area rep, I can see we have the very similar problem. And maybe uh, I see uh, the very good inspiration, the free tours, not in the kind of the providing, in the, in the kind of the promotion and the marketing. We are maybe just a little bit overqualified. We need more soft skills, especially the modern techniques and the pioneer of the modern techniques is our Sebastian. On which way? So we, are, we must have the vision, the vision and the target. So we must think big. We must ignore all no sayers and work hard, maybe harder like before, and not only take and give back. It's not from me, it's from Arnold Schwarzenegger. And with Hasta la Vista, baby, is, is the floor going back to, to uh, our Esther. Well, thank you very much. Uh, is that your picture without the beard? Yes, that we're seeing yes, it's, now? It's, yeah, it's, they, I, it's me. Oh, you decide to keep the beard now or? No, no, until the Christmas Eve, uh, I, I promise okay. that, uh, that the neighbors, I will be uh, the Santa. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. And we will quickly move on to Moldova if they are available to speak to us now. Esther, Moldova are not with us. So we only have one more presentation from Ireland, uh, from ATGI. So I'm not sure if you'd like to um, just give Sebastian opportunity to put up the poll um, before we move on. Um, Sebastian, would you like to do the poll with those um, participants online at the moment? Sebastian is missing in action. Do you want to take a few questions, Esther, while I get hold of Sebastian before we move on with um, Ireland? Yes, we have a little extra time since we have one presenter not going to do their presentation today. So if you uh, would like to begin asking any of the panelists actually uh, for some further information. Don't be shy. 
Uh, so there's one question in um, our question and answer box. It's for Jana in uh, Kazakhstan. And it says, can you please tell us a bit more about the tourist markets you receive from abroad, nationalities, types of tours? So just a bit more about Kazakhstan. Do you get authority support, uh, your education as tourist guides? And uh, do the guides see the need for an association? So it's three questions actually, but I think our uh, viewers are very interested in what is happening in Kazakhstan. If Jana is still there, maybe she could give us a little bit more. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yes, the question, because I, I told very little, <laughs> sorry. Okay. The, uh, actually, Kazakhstan is uh, a new destination for um, the tourists. And uh, before we were trying to develop more of a business tourism uh, and Kazakhstan was uh, kind of uh, imaging itself in the international community as the country where the big uh, negotiations and forums of uh, government uh, level were hosted. But um, after, uh, um, in, in the beginning of 2000, many young people start coming to Kazakhstan, opening Kazakhstan, and we had a lot of off-road and adventure tourists. But in the uh, recent, like uh, 10 years ago, uh, big companies, tourist companies like Mir Corporation, Odyssey, uh, and uh, some other big American companies, they started uh, signing the agreements uh, with the local tour operators of Kazakhstan. And uh, recently, like uh, five years ago, they started to bring American tourists to Kazakhstan. Um, and uh, so we had this uh, in tourism. Uh, firstly, we had very young people and also uh, those like students almost who just heard about Kazakhstan, but uh, mainly people who come here, they don't know anything about our country. So when they hear Kazakhstan, they they don't know even with what to compare about this country and what to expect. Uh, they knew that they know mainly that this country was former Soviet Union. So, but with Soviet Union also, they don't know what to expect. It is like Eastern Europe, which is more of a uh, like a former communistic regime. Uh, or it is more of a, like Mongolia when people are still riding horses. And uh, of course, uh, mainly this country is positioned as adventurous. So only those people who are looking for adventure, they try to come uh, to Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, we had... Uh, like uh, by statistically out of 140 countries Kazakhstan is placed on the 80 number 80 uh, for this tourism and uh, we have uh, very less tourists uh, coming like uh, it is not more than uh, 6 million people and I think that this is more of a high number because uh, actual number it could be more and more less, maybe more than 2 million people in, in a year. So, mm -hmm. but with COVID, of course, we don't have uh, any tourists and, uh, and also Kazakhstan is very large country. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, logistic, logistically, we are not that much developed because if we go from East Kazakhstan by train or by like, a, by of course by plane it will take four hours, but by train it will take three days to reach from one part to another part. So logistically Kazakhstan is uh, behind. And also for tourism, we are not that much well developed, but uh, now government try to uh, fi like fi finance this, um, try to develop for tourism, 
because uh, girl, uh, like uh, of course they understood the authorities understood that tourism is also can be a very big um, uh, engine for economics yeah. and uh, with all these authorities they tried to support tourist guides because we have a big country but we don't have guides and of course as we don't don't have these qualified guides uh, some other guys from uh, neighboring countries, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, they started coming and they started uh, taking this job as guides because also Uzbekistan was a little bit more developed for tourism because even during the Soviet time, Uzbekistan was um, kind of a touristic destination. In Kyrgyzstan also like uh, they have mountains and they have a similar landscape so they also uh, we have also shared the similar history so they also could work as guides so that is why the association we needed very badly to regulate all these activities and to um how to support our local guides and authorities how do they uh, also support like uh, we uh, we have university of tourism and actually before the tour guides they needed to have a degree four years bachelor's degree to be a tour guide but now nowadays time is very much fast uh, running fast and we need to prepare guides not wasting these four years because that uh, during the Soviet time when we were preparing the guides, they were kind of multifunctional guides. They could work in museums, they could work in national parks, they could work in the mountains. So kind of, uh, but now we have very strictly divided. For mountains, it is mountaineering guides, instructors, we call them. Uh, then we have museum guides, we have guides interpreters, and uh, government tries uh, also to regulate these courses because not everyone can teach guides, but only accredited, uh, accredited uh, companies or accredited authorities. And uh, we have the six months courses. So that's why uh, when we joined, um, we opened this association like all of us it was a decision of all guides uh working in kazakhstan that we need our uh, association which will be separate different from kazakh tourism association because before everything was regulated by Kazakh Tourism Association, which is, of course, more uh, protecting the tour operators, tour uh, agencies and uh, hotels. But um, now uh, we uh, also uh, we have a law which is regulating the tour guides activity. So that is the support from um, government. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, I have a, a quick question for all of you. Um, here in Chicago, we have a, a sizable Christmas market every year, which was canceled this year, and it's virtual. Somehow, it's just not the same sitting home with your hot chocolate and looking at pictures of Christmas items to buy. So uh, how did it go in? Um, particularly in Europe with most of you, uh, were the Christmas markets, uh, the major Christmas markets mostly canceled? Well, we are going to have a Christmas market, but the moment they're building it. In I see. Yeah. Okay, so you are going to have it in Andorra. Any, any yes. other place having their markets? Slovakia. After the long discussion, we cancelled the food and beverages zones and a few of the Christmas markets. The answer sounds yes, Christmas markets, but without food and without drinks. That Only a couple of them, yeah, mostly are cancelled. And, and people will be wearing masks at these events? It's obligatory now in outdoor too, yeah. 
outdoor too. Yeah, in Andorra, we have to wear it outdoor all the time, except the mountains. Okay. In Spain, we don't know what's going to happen on Christmas. That's, I think it was, it will be tomorrow that the Spanish government will tell us the decision of the country for us in Christmas. So by now we know we, that even at uh, Christmas day, uh, we can uh, be even in families, only six people at the same time in Christmas day, even the dinner uh, at home. And then about Christmas markets, nobody knows what's going to happen yet. I see that uh, Sebastian is back online. Uh, are we ready to take a survey now? The survey, Oops. the poll is there, it's appearing on everybody's screen right now. Um, mm -hmm. So if all those who are watching could please participate um, in the survey. Um, only the attendees are able to, so presenters or panelists, um, if you wouldn't mind, you, you cannot unfortunately participate at this time, but um, if the attendees could please complete the poll. Um, I see we are having some reactions to it. Uh, we have only had 20% people voting. Let's just see if we can have some more responses before we end it. Um, Okay, we have 35% people taking part. So the two questions we have posed is, are you able to start guiding in your city or region? And then how much do you rely on guiding as an income? And let's just give a little bit more time, a couple of seconds. We've had half of the people participating completed um, and they're given a few options for their replies. Will these results be shared immediately, Alushka? Yes, um, the, everyone can see it and I will share it now. Let's just give two, five more seconds. There we go. All right, so are you able to guide in your city and region? The majority of people said yes with rigorous lim limitations such as mm -hmm. small groups and safety distance. Um, and then coming in quite far behind, we have yes with small limitations such as mouth and nose protection. And then the second question is, how much do you rely on guiding as an income? The most answered one was full-time as the only income was 38% and 35% said full-time more than 50% of my income. So those two are pretty close. And then we'll share these results as well when we share the videos of this recording. Um, so thank you to everyone who participated in the poll and this is quite useful for us to see as well. So Esther, I believe we have one more presentation from ATGI and then we'll have time for questions amongst the pre presenters um, before we close for the day. Do we have Ireland ready with their presentation? Hello, Esther. Yes, indeed. I hope so. As long as I can manage to share this screen now. Um, let me just try. Well, I can see it. Can you see it? Yes, looks good. <laughs> I can't see much at the moment, but anyway, that's my presentation. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for your patience, and thank you for accommodating me to present today instead of tomorrow. So I'm presenting the Approved Tourist Guides of Ireland, known as ATGI. I'm Maureen Ahern. I'm the Honorary President. I live in Cork. I am a Cork City Guide, and I have been guiding for over 20 years. So I'm sure most of you know Ireland. Here it is, a very small island on the western extremity of Europe. And there are two jurisdictions, as you can see, two colours, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But there is no border between them and the island is marketed as an entire tourist destination, uh, the island of Ireland. 
Now, in 2019, the Republic of Ireland welcomed almost 10 million visitors. Tourism is a huge industry to us. It's worth 9.2 billion to the Irish economy and one in 10 people working in Ireland are employed in the sector. That of course would be in a normal year. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the association. You can enjoy the pictures of Ireland there. At Guy, in fact, goes back over 40 years. The original association was founded in 1976. So that's more than 44 years. We have today 479 members. And in fact, these members are located all over the island of Ireland. Our member guides would do lots of different types of work. It might be city tours, walking tours, shore excursions, outdoor hiking, cycling, conference incentive. Uh, so there's a very wide range of work there for people. And most of us specialize in a few things. Across our group, we have 21 languages in the portfolio. 40% of ATKI members speak two or more languages because we have a very wide range of markets from all over the world as well. 65 of our members are chauffeur guides, which means they're allowed to drive private groups up to seven people in an approved public service vehicle. And our qualifications can be either national, which covers the entire island, city, which would be Dublin or Cork, or regional, different, uh, just different regions of Ireland. Transition's a little bit slow here. So the year 2020 began as normal. You know, we had no idea what was coming down the tracks. In January, we were doing our usual promotional work to try to drive more membership to the organization. We have a members directory. There's a lot of work producing that. In February, our annual CPD lectures, outings, and we do a familiarization trip for our own members. Those things all happened. And March began with the expectation of a busy year and a prosperous season for everybody. This is what our directory looks like, the 2020 directory, a uh, full listing of all our members, their qualifications, their language skills, and this is distributed to the travel trade, to businesses in hard and soft copy format, and it's uh, also a way of driving business to our booking system on our website. I couldn't resist showing you a picture of the familiarization trip as well. This year we went to Ireland's hidden heartlands, the lake area, a wonderful experience, great fun, lots of water, and I don't just mean in the lakes. I'm finding the transition quite slow. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I can do anything about this. Okay, so this was life up to March, and then we have what we might call D-Day. The 12th of March was the day when our head of government announced the immediate closure of schools, of non-essential businesses, of cultural attractions, museums, you name it, for two weeks minimum and nobody knew quite how long this was going to continue. But what we were finding as guides was that the tours which should have been happening in March were cancelled in March, but put out to June, uh, rescheduled, but then tours booked for later in the season were not cancelled straight away. So we still had some hope. So what do you think started to happen to our beautiful, unspoilt island when people stopped traveling? We do depend, of course, we're an island. We need aeroplanes, we need ships to bring our people here. So from March, here's what happened. Uh, the collapse of tourism on the island, an estimated loss of 75% of business overall in the tourist industry, but guides lost 95% of their work. Why? Because guides depend on people coming from overseas. Hotels, pubs, restaurants, attractions, they will get Irish people coming, but uh, Irish people don't generally book a tour guide. They download the free app. So what do we do? We have to survive. Cancellations are pouring in. Some guides have not worked since autumn 2019. Now, the Irish government did introduce weekly support payments on an emergency basis, 350 euros a week if somebody became unemployed as a result of this shutdown. The problem for guides was we didn't fit the official profile, if you like, of unemployed. Guides in the thinking of the government are classified as seasonal workers 
numbers. This is not true. We pay taxes over 52 weeks of the year. We make our tax returns on that basis. So we tried to explain we have no work. We didn't get laid off last week. Our planned work is being cancelled on an ongoing basis. So the association worked very hard to support its members at that time by lobbying the government departments. Some people got the payments very quickly, others still haven't got them. So it was quite random. As soon as the pandemic broke out, we started reaching out to our members on Zoom because now people are locked at home, they're going mad, they're trying to educate their children, there's no school, it's all very difficult. So our members started sharing their expertise and experience with each other on Zoom. We had a series of online talks, it might be about a historical topic, the trees of Ireland, sculptures and monuments of Dublin, um, how to forage on the beach, all kinds of interesting topics so we extended our own portfolios to inform our commentary. We did some training offering virtual tours, learning to use audio apps and each, pe each people were sharing experience with each other as to how this was working for them. We had a CPD session observational skills for guides because one of our own members did qualify as a FEG accredited trainer this year, that's Jesse MacDonald. And we also shared some business ideas, guides who learned how to get some local financial support and build their own website, for example. We had talks about taxation, insurance, practical business things as well. Oh, sorry, I'm just, yeah. Okay, one of our most important talks was on mental health, and we invited all tourist guides on the island of Ireland to that, not just our own members. So there would be more, more than 1,000 qualified guides on the island of Ireland, and we felt this was a very important topic because this crisis was affecting everybody. We were also delighted to avail of the lectures offered by the FEG trainers in accreditation. So this was another uh, way to use our Wednesday mornings for a few weeks. And then because um, we decided to be more strategic, there was no work. Uh, people were still not traveling to Ireland. Our airlines are in a state of collapse. Our airports are in serious trouble. So Atkey decided to join the Irish Tourism Industry Confederation. Why was this? Because nobody was talking about guides. Everyone was talking about accommodation, uh, visitor attractions, all of the sectors that people think make up the tourism industry. We were saying guides are the most important cog in the wheel. But we did support the uh, ITIC call for action to the government. It was a way to roll out this system. to Marin, we have one minute. Oh, I don't believe it. My goodness. OK, I'm going to have to well, cut this story. Yes, yeah, it goes so quickly, doesn't it? It really does. OK, so we developed our own business plan. We prepared a business case, the economic benefits of professional guiding in tourism recovery. And I did have the opportunity to prevent this to the Tourism Recovery Task Force, which was um, appointed by the Irish government in July. So what I'll do is I'll flick through a few of these now. But what we did was we made the case that guides need more support. Support. Some of our members worked hard to research and test the various audio apps so we could do social distancing, um, you know, when we got back to work again. An exchange of ideas forum led to some new initiatives. GuideFest, what's the story, was aiming at Irish people to try to get them out to use a live guide. This had to be postponed because, as I talk to you now, we're back to five kilometres, stay at home, nobody's allowed out. So that has been postponed until the new year, but hopefully it will happen very soon. We engaged with the National Tourism Authority and we're signing up to the safety charter because that does give um, confidence to people who are very worried about their own safety, our sustainability policy. We did have support from the Irish government. So our Minister for uh, Tourism, in fact, has announced she will shortly appoint an oversight group which will monitor the implementation of the recovery plan. She also officially opened the AFKI AGM on the 21st of November, Minister Catherine Martin TD. So we do feel we've made some progress by lobbying the government uh, and joining ITIC rather than just um, shouting on public radio or something like that. 
So what happens next? I'm sure you're going to stop me. You can read the slide. But some, we, I do believe some good things have come out of this because we had to rethink. It wasn't perfect the way it was. We had overcrowding. We had some difficulties like that. So we have to be ready for the new tourism in Ireland. I think it will be a better experience because uh, there'll be maybe less mileage, uh, more stops, more time, smaller groups, a much better experience. And we shall be ready by adapting and upskilling. I'm really sorry if I went over the time. Uh, no, you did not. That was perfect timing. Okay. And uh, thank you very much for sharing that information with us. Not at um, all. You're welcome. Before I make some closing remarks, I want to uh, check with uh, Viola and uh, Alushka whether they have some additional questions still in the chat box and if it will be okay if we run, say, two minutes over our, our time. Thank you, Esther. I think you can do the closing remarks and wrap up. We have reached our time limit um, and any additional questions we will address in email and our presenters are also available if our members have any further queries. Well, WFTGA thanks the presenters and the technicians who made this possible. I think that thank you isn't quite enough. Uh, shall we all give a round of applause to the presenters? Oh. Thank you and good evening or good morning as the case may be. Hope to see you around again soon. Thank you, Esther. And just thank you to Sebastian and the technical team. We appreciate your support behind the scenes and as well to all the presenters. And just a reminder to everyone to please register to attend tomorrow. Uh, we have a different group of associations from across the globe and we look forward to what they have to present. And to our presenters, thank you. You all offered the most amazing advice and inspiration and I really think we're walking away today again with a lot of informative and really stuff that makes us proud to be part of this family across the globe. So from the tourist guys everywhere, thank you very much and thank you to all. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.